judgment that he executes. We need to know more about him. Knowing more about him helps us to understand where our standing is with him. It tells us there that we need to be reminded, verse 20, that we are mere men. We are but men. So this king we're looking at, it's interesting, in Daniel chapter 4, and there's a prophecy, as you might expect, in the book of, Prof, of Dan, Daniel, which is a book of prophecy. You might expect it to talk about prophecy. It is a prophecy that's given in our story today that is a personal prophecy. And prophecies in the Bible are not confined to time events that um, deal with nations, but they're oftentimes prophecies or words of what's happening or what's going to happen if things don't change, if it continues in this direction. Like in our story today, Daniel chapter 4, we find it's a personal prophecy given to a king. It's also significant in unusual way that this chapter is actually written by a heathen monarch. You don't find that anywhere else in the Bible. But remember, God is not concerned so much about where we come from, but where we're heading to. Are you with me? God wants to seek and to save the lost, those who are considered of high esteem in the world, like this king of the most powerful nation and empire in the world in his time, and those who are considered not high in the esteem of the world. Here we find in Daniel chapter 4 that we have the story presented, and it's addressed um, in such a way that we get the idea right off the bat that it is written by none other than King Nebuchadnezzar himself. It's a lesson in pride, a lesson learned the hard way. It says, Nebuchadnezzar the king, verse 1, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth. How is it that he would be able to send this out? It wasn't a simple matter of sending a group email to all contacts. This message had to be given, read, repeated, and sent in physical form of one way or another to everybody that was within the realm of the Babylonian Empire. It's a pretty important thing when King Nebuchadnezzar sends out this group message. He says, included in this, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in the earth, peace be multiplied in you. Now, here we are in context in chapter 4 of Daniel. We've already noted that Daniel and his friends have been brought in captivity under the Babylonian rule. They have been marched in humiliation across the desert to be subjects of this kingdom. We know in Daniel chapter 2, there was the first dream that King Nebuchadnezzar dreams. He dreams about an image that God has set up a succession of powerful empires in the world that extend down to the close of time, and it is noted by closing with the return of the Son of Man, as symbolized by the rock cut out without human hands. Daniel who was subject to the king of Babylon and working for King Nebuchadnezzar, of whom he was taken captive away from his homeland. He gives the interpretation of the dream. He tells him the dream word for word, event by, by event, and he's blessed in all of that. Daniel chapter 3, we move forward to. We have the image that's set up by King Nebuchadnezzar. He intends to change the chain of events that God has said will happen. He sets up an image that is made out of the metal that represents him and his kingdom, intending to symbolize to the world who will come there to worship at its feet that his reign would last forever. Doesn't sound like a humble move at all. He struggles with pride. He struggles with his position. Now, 20 to 30 years later, we have chapter 4 of Daniel's um, book, chapter 4, addressed to all peoples everywhere, all languages of the world, and it gives these, this, these words of introduction. It almost seems like it should have come at the end, but I think the message if from beginning to end of this chapter is the same, and that is God is worthy to be praised. It sounds like on this tone that there is a message that got across somehow or ever to this king. He was transformed to be able to take the opportunity to give a message to all the realm, and when it's all said and done, to sum it up and to start it out and end it with the same words of declaration to the glory of God. You know, we sang, remind me, we sang an extra verse in there um, in our opening song. You know, we cannot sing too much. We cannot 
declare too much about the glory of God and praise Him too much. It is a wonder that we don't do more than we do. Here's what he says in, uh, in verse 2. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. Yeah. It is good to declare the signs and the wonders that God has worked for us. Isn't it? God is so good. Worthy to be praised. It's the message of song in heaven, and it ought to be the message of song in our heart too. I am going to declare, give me an opportunity, give me a voice. I want to declare the goodness of God. So oftentimes as we repeat the stories, the way things happen, we want to make ourselves somehow appear good, better, best if possible. That's the way it goes. We wind up being the hero of our story. And ought not to be. For this king who's going through the transformation, I believe that we all must go through, he sees his God worthy to be praised. And so he says, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders the Most High God has worked for me. It was not normal for a heathen monarch to give any credit to God. Something had to change in his heart and in his life. It's going to take something powerful to get him to this point. But remember, the Lord is known by the judgments he executes. What did we say? Most importantly, they're not only loving, they're caring, they're thoughtful, they're merciful, but they're also redemptive. God, in his redemptive plan, wants to better us, wants to change us, and ultimately he wants to redeem, he wants to save us. God is going to go to great lengths by the time this chapter is over to change what needs to be changed in the heart of Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, talk about having opportunity. He's there with Daniel, clearly a man of God. He has seen with his own eyes the dream, the vision that came to him by night. He has heard the interpretation and the retelling of the dream. He has seen the three Hebrew worthies in the fire, and they were burned, but they were not burned. They come out, and only the ropes that bound them, Daniel chapter 3, were destroyed. The people that took them up and threw them in the fiery furnace, they died for the sake of the heat of the fiery furnace that was heated up seven times. But God is going to continue working in his heart. We move forward in the story. Here's what he says in verse 3. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. You know, as we think back about the the overarching theme of pride being dealt with in this story in in, uh, Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 10, by pride we get contention. With the well-advised, there is wisdom. It is nearly impossible to advise a know-it-all. Have you ever found that to be true? Nearly impossible. In fact, I mean, we get to a place, we're not getting anywhere, we just stop stop yammering, stop trying, stop talking. Here we find somebody that God gets through to in an unconventional way. And as you think about your story and mine, recognize that God is fully willing to do what is necessary and in your life and mine to transform your heart and your attitude And your thoughts and your actions and your words and the whole bit. He is more than able, more than willing to do what's necessary in your life and mine. If we are struggling, if we are separated by pride, if we are resistant to God because of our pride, remember, God can fix that. Let's look at our story. Moving forward in the next verse, verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid. The thoughts of my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. You know, you wouldn't think King Nebuchadnezzar would be troubled about anything. Sometimes there is an idea in our mind, if we just had this, if we just had that, we would have peace that was unshakable. We think we need something that this world has to offer, but what we truly need is something God has to offer, and that is a security that's found only in Him. There He is. Flourishing was an understatement. I mean, things were going well. The greatest nation in the world, the greatest ruler that had been, King Nebuchadnezzar, has one dream. The visions of his head, they trouble him. It tells us there 
that in verse 6, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon. Remember, Daniel chapter 2, this has done, been done before. I don't know why in the world he just doesn't go straight to Daniel, but he doesn't. It seems to me that something in the passing of years has been lost. Can you identify with that? You know, we need a fresh daily relationship with God. A commitment with God that's new today and just as bright and just as powerful and just as connected as ever. We need to keep up with our relationship with God. To find the source of God's word in, in the Bible. To find it powerful, find it applicable and relevant to our life today. He turns to these other people and it tells us there that they did not make known to me its interpretation. Verse 7. Verse 8. But at last, finally. Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and him is the spirit of the holy God. And I told a dream to him, saying... Now, at this point, again, we recognize the power and influence that people who are connected to God have. And I pray and I hope that each one of us is ready when we are called upon to help our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, classmates, our connections, the people that know, ought to know that we're connected with God and we're willing to pray for them. It might be something so simple as saying, please pray for me about this. And when that opportunity comes, and it is an opportunity, let God work and let God be praised. Daniel is called upon and he, he tells him the dream. It tells us there in verse 9, he says, because the spirit of the, the holy God is in you and no secret troubles you, it's been troubling me, it won't trouble you, this will not perplex you, you'll have an answer. Here he tells him his dream beginning in verse 9. 10. Note with me, Daniel chapter 4 and verse 10. He tells them this dream about a tree. Daniel's listening intently, and you've got to know he's praying all the time, God, please, once again, give meaning, give interpretation, give a message according to the request of this man that he may know that you are truly the Most High God. Here it is. He said, I was looking and I beheld a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong and its height reached the heavens and could, not, and could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in the branches and all the flesh was fed from it. So far in the dream, things are looking pretty good, right? You've got this tree. It's a blessing. To all the earth, it reaches to the all the earth. It has an influence, it has, it has a, a, a meaning, a significance to everything around it. And everything is looking good until you get to the transition in verse 13. You knew it had to come. It says, and I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed there was a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven. Does heaven still intervene today? Amen, it does. God is intervening in my life and in your life in powerful ways. One, I mean, one of the realities in our experience, if we'll just open our eyes and recognize it to be what it truly is and give God credit because it's due, and that is that God still works miracles today. Sometimes we reserve the explanation of, well, that was a miracle for something that we choose to appreciate and say, yeah, wow, God really blessed me in that way, without recognizing that God's miracle-working blessings don't have to be recognized on our part as a good thing. It could be a simple intervention in our life when God intends to transform us as He did Nebuchadnezzar that is just as much a powerful blessing as any other blessing he's working in our life. But God works miracles. Here's the intervention. The, the angel comes down. He says, he cried aloud and said, chop down the tree, cut off its branches, strip its leaves, scatter its fruit, let the beast get out from under it, the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, let the stump and the roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts of the grass of the field. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast and let seven times pass over him. Wow. Something happened to this beautiful, prosperous tree. The simple message in the first part was be blessed and be a blessing. And we're all comfortable with that, right? Sounds pretty good. Be blessed and be a blessing. That's half the gospel. 
but we ought to give the full gospel message. It continues, at the intervention, at the cry of the angel. And you know that this heavenly being that comes down is not speaking on a whim. He's not speaking on just um, a, a, a thought or some abstract idea. In the mind of Nebuchadnezzar, he's troubled because he sees this thing and being explained in the pronouns of it, the tree. And uh, in, in verse 13, it, the tree, and the, the tree. And now it's moving into verse 15. Now we're looking at him, his, and given the heart of a man. There is a transition from being looking at this tree as representing something figurative, something abstract, something that could be whatever you could ascribe to it to be, to now being presented as a man that it really represents. He senses in his heart something of the meaning and the application to him personally, and it doesn't sound good when they talk about chopping off the branches, scattering the fruit, strip its leaves. Let the beasts that were fed, let them, let them go somewhere else. Until, again, the Lord is known by the judgment he executes, until it tells us that seven times pass over him. Let him be given the heart of the beast. You know, he couldn't have known there in any way the fullness and the literal meaning of what he's about to go through if he doesn't take this warning message to heart. So oftentimes we don't take God's message to heart. But Daniel's been listening to this, and we get down to verse 17, the continuation of this um, message. This decision is the decree of the watchers and the sentence by word of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whoever he will and sets it over the lowest of men. There is a period of time given to this description of the tree, which represents the king, that's going to happen. There's going to be an intervention that's going to be administered until the man recognizes that the Most High rules and that he he sets over the kingdom of men and gives the kingdom to whoever he will and sets it over the lowest of men. Psalms chapter 83, Psalms chapter 83 and verse 16. Hold your place there in Daniel and turn with me, if you will, as we look at four verses in Psalms chapter 83. Again, in our prayer, in our thinking, in our outline for what we need God to do according to us, our advisement of God, we don't want to be ashamed. We don't want to be embarrassed. In fact, We want to be like the first part of the dream. We want to be blessed and we want to be a blessing. However, God knows very truly, very clearly what is for our best good. Here's what it says in Psalms chapter 83 beginning in verse 16. Fill their faces with shame. Well, that doesn't sound very good. That they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish, that they may know that you whose name alone is the Lord are the most high over all the earth. Now, we've looked at the introduction of chapter 4 in Daniel, and it's given us already a hint that the transformation is going to take place. He comes back around to recognizing that he is not the majesty of heaven. He's not over all the kingdoms of the earth, although his position seems to indicate that, although the reverence and respect he gets seems to prove that. He's going to get to the place where he understands that the Most High rules. Now, let's look at this a little bit more in detail. There's two kinds of shame that are granted here, and it depends upon the response. Again, remember this always. Pride, whatever it is we're prideful about, can be humbled. Can be humbled. There's a point to it. The embarrassment is not to take somebody down a notch but to give them an eternal future, give them an opportunity to be saved at last. Notice these two shames. Verse 16, fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name. There's two things that are going to happen. Either the people who deal with embarrassment, deal with shame, they're either going to turn to God and seek his name. That's his reputation, his character, who he really is. They're going to seek God in the face of coming to grips with 
that difficult experience in life, they're going to be blessed by it because they're going to seek God. That's the first group. The second group, moving into verse 17, let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame. That's left to shame. That means they don't get away from the shame, the shame of not seeking the Lord, it says, and perish. The word perish there is talking about an eternal destination that is not good. If in our shame, if in our embarrassment, when things are dealt with in our life that we're prideful about, if we do not seek God in the face of that, we will be left to the shame and ultimately perish. Here's what we need to know, verse 18, that they may know that you whose name alone is the Lord are the most high over all the earth. That is our privilege to know and understand and accept in our life. King Nebuchadnezzar needed to do it, powerful as he was, you and I certainly need to do it as well. We may think King Nebuchadnezzar had every right to be prideful. He did not, and neither do we. Let's turn back to chapter 4 in Daniel where we pick up our story again. The indication of the dream, again, knowing the story and where it's going is pretty apparent to us. But imagine hearing this for the first time, seeing it in night and in the night, being troubled, calling the wise men, Finally turning back to Daniel, who had interpreted the first dream, he is about to hear the interpretation of this dream. Cut down the tree, leave it bound with a band of iron. Remember, in this band of iron put around the tree, the stump that's going to be left there and the roots left there, you can look at it as confinement or you can look at it as protection. By the way, the law of God is one of those things. Many people look at it as confinement. You know, it tells me all the things I can't do. I don't like that. But remember, the confinement of God is ultimately for our blessing as well. There was a transformation that was needed. King Nebuchadnezzar is just about to find it. Moving forward in the story, we find there, let's go back to that verse where we left off in verse um, Verse 17, the last part of it. In order that the living may know, that includes you and I, by the way, that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. He gives it to he will and sets it over the lowest of men. We've got to be reminded that our privileges in life are not all on the basis of who we are, but the blessing of God is not something for us to be prideful about. Whatever it is, talents, opportunities, even the breaths we breathe, the heartbeats that we experience, all of those, a gift from God. We've got to give proper due adoration, praise, and glory to God. So we move forward in the story, verse 18. This dream, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, again, that's speaking of Daniel, declare its interpretation. So the king is asking for it, but I want to just Think with you about the natural hesitation in the heart of Daniel. To tell the monarch the words he's about to share, this is not a good career move, okay? This is not going to advance you. This is not going to go well with you. In fact, this may be the last interpretation you ever give. This may be the last words you ever say. And so there may be a natural hesitation in the part of Daniel. Nevertheless, he, like we, is not called to give a popular half-gospel message. He's called to give the full gospel message. Here it says in verse 19, chapter 4 of Daniel, Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. There we are. It would be troubling to know what the interpretation of the dream is. Do you soften it? What do you do? You know, he could have been tempted to say something like, listen, king, um, live forever. We all could do a little bit better in the humility department, don't you think? It'd probably be well for all of us, really, to not be so prideful. I mean, wouldn't you be tempted to soften it just a little bit? No, not for Daniel. Because he's got a message from God that he is called upon to deliver, and he's going to deliver it in clarity. Here's what he says. 
Verse 20, the tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, and whose height reached to the heavens, which could not be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and his fruit and abundant, and it was food for all, under the beasts of the field dwelt, and the birds of the branches and the heaven had their home. It is you, O king. Verse 22, wait, the one, the tree that had its branches cut off, the fruit scattered, the leaves stripped, the birds scatter. The beast told to go somewhere else. It is you, O king. Remember, truth is not always popular. In fact, Daniel is about to do something that we also are, a message that we're supposed to share as well. It's a repentance message. Do you know many people that like to be given a repentance message? He's about to advise the king how he can fix this. How he can get back on the path that's straight and narrow. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong, and your greatness has grown and reached to the heavens, and your dominion to the end of the earth. Verse 23, inasmuch the king saw the watcher, a holy one, and he begins to explain this in chapter 4 and verse 24. Now moving to that, this is the interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the Most High, which has come to my Lord the king. Here is the personal prophecy in chapter 4 of Daniel. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They will make you eat grass like oxen. They will wet you with the dew of heaven. And seven times or seven years will pass over you. Tell you know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomever He chooses. Insomuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. Redemptive. Judgment. You will know the Lord, Psalms chapter 9 and verse 16, by the judgment he executes. The punishment, the judgments, they're redemptive in nature. It is not God's plan to destroy us, but to transform us. It was for King Nebuchadnezzar an opportunity that he had this dream. It was because of God's love that he spoke to him and that he troubled his heart. Continues on there. It says, insomuch they gave the command to leave the stump and the roots of the field, your kingdom will be assured to you after you come to know. The expectation on the part of heaven is that Nebuchadnezzar will go into this time of difficulty, but that he will come out on the other side transformed. And what is it that he's promised to get back, amazingly so, at the end of it? His kingdom. Isn't that just, it, it's baffling. How could someone go and be driven from their throne, have to live with the beasts of the field, and then come back and get their kingdom after all? I mean, kingdoms don't work like that, right? This is not natural. There's nothing about this that makes sense on human terms. But that's okay. The prophecies of God don't have to. God can do what He wants. He can do what He seems sees fit in your life and in mine. The promise is there. The prophecy is given. And now for the reaction. Well, first we're going to get to verse 27, which is the advice that Daniel gives. And it's good advice for us. It reminds us of Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. He has shown thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to love mercy, do justly, and to walk humbly with your God. Here's what he says, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Verse 27, Daniel chapter 4, break off your sins. Again, many people don't want to hear that. They want to hear that sin's okay. They want to hear that there is no sin. There is no divine standard. That's the comfortable news that many people are telling. That is not the truth. And to condone sin is never loving. To tell the truth is loving. Tell it in love, but tell the truth. Break off your sins by being righteous. Romans chapter 12, verse 21, be not overcome. Don't be destroyed by evil, but overcome evil with good. How are you going to break off your sins? By doing righteous. Sin is not just about the things that we do that we shouldn't do. Sin is also about us not doing the things that we should do. Break off your sins by being righteous. That's the first part. And your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Evidently, there was something lacking in specifics of his dealings with the poor. For Nebuchadnezzar, who had all the wealth and majesty and opportunity to do good in this area, he didn't do it. Stop that. Break off your sins 
by doing good and by showing mercy. Again, the connection with Micah 6, 8, so powerful there. He has shown thee. It's been shown. It's been told. There is no new alternative revelation. God has shown us what is required of us to do justly. Surrender to God's standard of right and wrong. Don't need to revise, make up our own. We don't need to rely on popular opinion, take a poll, see which way the wind's blowing. We need to follow the word of God. Do justly. Break off your sins by doing justly. Again, a surrender that is also going to ending up in the last part of Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. That surrender is not possible while there is pride clung to in our heart. We are going to at the end of it, walk, how? Humbly with our God. Second part, show mercy. Here it says in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 27, in Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, it says to love mercy, to love mercy, to desire opportunity, to look for ways to bless our fellow men. And at the end of it, the promise in Micah chapter 6 and verse 8 is, we will be with who? With our God. We will walk humbly with Him. You know, God is so practical in the methods in your life and in mine, giving us every opportunity to change from our prideful, stuck-on-self, know-it-all type of behavior. Remember, the reality is Pride is not just a disease that somebody else has to struggle with. Pride is in our human fallen nature. Pride needs to be dealt with. And if we will cooperate with God, He will help us. We don't have to learn the hard way like Nebuchadnezzar, but He did. And so we find, as we continue in the story, verse 28, it says, At the end of 12 months, in chapter 4 and verse 28, 12 months of mercy, the advice of Daniel was unheeded, evidently. He just didn't. At the end of 12 months, he was walking by the royal palace in Babylon. It says in verse 30, the king spoke, saying, Is this not great Babylon which I have built? Many people would have given him credit and said, Yeah, he probably should have been able to say that. No. It's, notice the repetition of self in this verse. Is this not great Babylon that I have built for royal dwelling place by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? And here we're about to see the interruption of heaven again. Remember the first one? was during the dream. He saw the tree. He's, he, he saw things going well. There's the interruption of heaven. Now the king is speaking in verse 30, and the interruption of heaven, the king of kings, is about to interrupt the king in verse 31. While the world was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. I don't know what that felt like to hear those words, but he heard them. That's why he's able to retell the story in vivid detail. Then it says, they will drive you from men, your dwelling place, the beasts of the field. They will make you eat grass like oxen. Seven times shall pass over to you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. That very hour, verse 33, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men, ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven. His Hair grown like the eagle's feathers, his nails like bird's claws. Living like a wild beast. Hygiene, it's gone. His dignity, self-respect, all of it. And God's dealing with the pride in this king's heart. It is no... There's no way that this story can end well. Except... God has not only promised and prophesied that this part of the story would happen, but remember the band of iron? I don't know if during this time, if the king's heart wanders back to the dream or not. I don't know what he, what he is cognitively thinking about or not. But it gets to the end of it all, and it says, at the end of the time, verse 34, Nebuchadnezzar lifted my eyes to heaven. That's where we ought to lift our eyes today, shouldn't we? You know, the devil wants to keep us just so busy, so burdened, just keep our head down, looking 
like the uh, Pilgrim's Progress, there was the, uh, the muckraker, the guy that was just groveling, and every now and then he'd pull up this little trinket or that. And, oh, look at this. And above his head all the time was a crown of glory. The devil wants to keep us looking down, entertained, but God wants us to look up to something better. It says that he looked up, lifted my eyes to heaven, my understanding returned to me, and I did what? I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. You know, when our reasoning returns to us, we'll do the same thing. When our reasoning is returned to us, we will also praise the Most High God. Are you with me? That's serious business, folks. It tells us in James chapter 4 and verse 6, the Lord resists the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. His reasoning returns. He lifts his eyes towards heaven. And he praises the Most High God. Now, the prophecy has not been fully demonstrated yet, but it's going to. His dominion, it continues, is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven. God does not tell us prophecy, remember this, just because he knows the future. God is working out the future. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah that he is doing his pleasure. He is doing His will. He's working it out. And the beautiful thing of it all is He's doing it in our favor. Isn't that wonderful? The Lord is known by the judgment He executes. He does according to His will in the army of heaven among the inhabitants of earth. No one can restrain His hand, not even the devil. Or say to Him, what have you done? Will you correct God? Will you question Him? When he intervenes in your life, when things don't work out like you, you thought that they should, like you wanted them, why would we want anything other than what God wants when he wants what is for our eternal best? At the same time, my reason returned to me for the glory of my kingdom, my honor, my splendor returned to my, me. My counselors, nobles resorted to me, and I was restored to my king, and excellent majesty was added to me. In the intervention of God, difficult, challenging as it is, God has a way of working out things, not only returning to us what was lost, but adding something to it. Isn't that what heaven's about? Do you think in heaven things are going to be just as good as they are here? Oh, my. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Excellent majesty was added. It was impossible for him to, I mean, you know, kingdoms don't work like this. People are like, no, no, that's, that's Nebuchadnezzar's throne. No, no, you can't. No, there would be people killing one another in order to gain that throne. Except that the band of iron. God was protecting the government, and giving it back to the humble, transformed king that had stood in pride, in defiance to God even, not taken the advice, but restored to him. Again, James chapter 4 and verse 6, closing with this thought. Some people are proud of face. Some people are proud of race. Some people are proud of place, face, race, all different kinds of things, but we ought to be proud of what? grace. Remember, Paul said, I determined not to, in, to know anything save what? Christ and Him crucified. You know, we ought to be lifting up the true God of heaven, the most high God, more than we do, shouldn't we? He is good. He does His will. He is known by the judgments He executes. Psalms chapter 9, verse 16, and verse 20 tells us, that we also ought to know that we are but men. We are but men. Who God is needs to be understood today. Who we are needs to be understood. We are dependent upon Him. Good thing He loves us. Good thing like in Nebuchadnezzar's life, He's working in our favor. It may take an intervention for us to cut loose of our pride. Like the song we're about to sing, 159, Old Rugged Cross, 
tell all my trophies at last I lay down, you know what they're worth? Nothing. Just cling to the cross. Cling to the grace of God working in our favor, working to save us at last. You know, that text says, the Lord resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. You know, it is the proud who stubbornly resist God. Say, no, I don't want anything to do with God. I don't need God. That's what the proud say in their heart. They may spell it out or not. But to those who will be humble, those who will see God for who He really is, what does God offer to us is grace. We need it so much. Let's go ahead and we'll stand and sing 159, The Old Rugged Cross, together. song is hymn 159 the old rugged cross be seated. Please bow. Please bow your heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this church service, and please help everybody to have a safe trip home. In Jesus' name, amen.
If you are on the Sabbath School Council, that includes pastor, all children's and adult Sabbath School um, teachers and volunteers, and also our Sabbath School secretary, um, Steve Smart, would like to meet with all of us right in front of the sanctuary at this time. So thank you so much.